Good evening and welcome everybody. Uh, we are going to be speaking tonight about uh, caring for cold crops. We have with us uh, myself, Keep uh, Keto from Keep Growing Each Right, Keto Pilak. I coordinated education programming amongst other things. And I have uh, my co-director here, Ms. T. Rushton, um, who is also on the education team. And uh, she's gonna be teaching the class with us tonight. Um, we're uh, gonna start out with a, a little poll. Uh, so if you could uh, pay attention and, and uh, if you could uh, you know, answer the questions really quick, just to make it a little bit fun and interactive and uh, share some information with us so we can get a sense of who's in the room with us. Um, so I'll hand it over to T and uh, you can take it away. Sure. See, it just, it feels so much better just seeing your names on here. I'm like, I'm like, hey, Daniel. Hey, Cynthia. Hey, Joanne. You know, so right. even if I can't see your face, it feels better. Right. <laughs> hey, Mark. Um, okay, let's launch the first question. I wanted to know, how many years have you been gardening? Can you see that, Keto? Not yet. Oh, maybe because you're the host, so you can't answer. Okay. Is everybody else seeing the questions? Yes. 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 Okay. okay, great. Okay, so I'll give you a couple more seconds on that. It looks like most people have answered. All right. All right, I'll end that one and share the results. So can you see the results, Keto, or no? I cannot, but that's okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> we have 32% newbies. Welcome. We have 19% um, who have been gardening one to two years. We have 13% three to four years. And then we have 35% five plus years. That's, that's awesome. So if you're a brand newbie, your job is to stop me and ask questions if you need to, and feel free to get all those questions out. And if you're and if you've been in the program five plus years, that means that uh, you should answer questions if you want to. <laughs> if I'm messing up or if I'm saying something wrong or if you uh, want to add to the conversation, definitely feel free. Um, okay. So let me go to the next one. Mm, I think here we go. Got it. All right, here we go. Do you know the difference between a cold crop and a hot crop? Yes, I do. Um, no. <laughs> most of the time. So most of the time, most of the time I do, but I get I get caught up sometimes. Yes, I do. No, I don't, or most of the time. Okay, I'll give you a couple more seconds on there. Looks like a lot of people have chimed in. We're almost there. I missed the poll somehow. I'll find it. Oh, are you on your phone? Maybe you have to tab over if you're on your phone. Sometimes it can be hard to find. All right. I got it. Got it? Okay. All right, let me share the results. So, Keto, I'm going to read it off to you since you can't see. We got 40%, 46% say they do know what a cold crop is. Woo woo. We got 23% that's like, nope. Tell me all the things. <laughs> so that's what we're going to talk about. And then we have 31% um, or more, like most of the time I do. So that's pretty cool. All right. And then I got one more question for you guys. One more question. And here we go. Which spring pest do you struggle with, struggle the most with? There should be a the in between there. <laughs> Uh, you can do multiple choice on this. So if you got a couple of things that are bothering you, feel free to tell me both of the things that are bothering you. Uh, aphids, flea beetles, cabbage loopers, all of the above. Michelle said rats. <laughs> um, none of the above. Yeah, you're right, Michelle. I kind of, I was going to put four leggeds on there and I was kind of just focusing on, on the insect varieties, but yeah we'll have to uh we'll have to talk about the four legs i don't have much info on the slides about four legs so maybe we'll have a little conversation about that keto yeah toward the end <clears throat> all 
All right, let's end the poll and see. There's a couple people in the chat. I see. I'll share the results. And Keto, what do you think is the what do you think is the top one? Aphids, flea beetles, or cabbage loopers? Aphids. You're right. You're absolutely right. Thirty-seven <laughs> percent said aphids are their major problem. Eleven percent said flea beetles. Six percent said cabbage loopers. And 26% said all of the above. So that's pretty high. And 30% um, said none of the above. Fanny said squirrels. You know, I started to put squirrels on there. I surely did. <laughs> um, <laughs> those can be, they can be an issue, especially in Detroit in certain neighborhoods. Yeah. Well, not the worst. <laughs> so let's, uh, Keto, let's save some time toward the end because most of these slides are focused on the, uh, the, the creepy crawlies, but um, we can okay. save some time to talk about the, the four-legged ones. For sure. Toward the end. So should I jump right in or did you have other questions for folks? No, I think we should go for it. Okay. Now keep me straight, guys. If you can't see the screen right, let me know. We'll go ahead and jump in. You have that box at the top. And the other box should go in a second. How's that? One more in the middle. Oh, yep, all good. All good. All right. All right. Well, hopefully you guys all either have picked up your coal crops or you are have plans to. You have a slot set up maybe for this coming week or you just picked them up. And so you have a tray of coal crops sitting, waiting, and we're going to talk about caring for cold crops today. And let's see. All right, so we asked that question, what are cold crops? And um, look like most people knew, but let's just, let's just start at the beginning. <laughs> what are the cold crops? Uh, this chart, you, you should have this in your instructions, uh, in your planting instructions. If you don't, I believe it's online. No, it's in, this is in your plan your garden document, but this is the classic um, farmer's uh, uh, planting guide. And uh, you wanna just take a note at the ones, the crops that can you can grow in March and April are considered cold crops. They're considered cold crops because they can take a little bit of cold. They can, they can they're a little bit more frost tolerant. Um, so you'll plant them in March and April in the spring, and then oftentimes you can get another round in in the fall so they can take some colder temperatures. So you'll notice that a lot of the ones that you plant earlier in the season, they don't like the heat. You know, some of them you can plant all the way through, but a lot of them don't like the heat. So you wouldn't plant, um, for example, on this chart, you wouldn't plant um, lettuce in the dead of summer. We all know what would happen if that, if that had took place. And if you're brand new, if you try to plant it in the dead of summer, it's not going to be too happy because they like, they actually like a little bit of cooler weather. So um, once you're, if you plant them in the spring, uh, come summer, you are, uh, they're probably going to bolt, uh, go to seed, and we'll show some pictures of that in the slides. And then you can do another round in the, in the fall. So, um, so Keto, just keep me in check. If there's any questions that come up in the chat, we can keep going. Will do. All right, <clears throat> so some general care tips, uh, of course, just general things for gardeners in general is making sure that your vegetables have enough light. You look and try to get eight to 10 hours of sunlight a day. Um, make sure your garden uh, gets enough water. So, you know, in the in the dead of the summer, that can look like one to, one to two times a week, um, especially if it's not raining. If it's raining, you might be able to get away with um, without the watering, but particularly, when you're doing, when you're, when you first put your crops in or when you're um, first put your seeds in, you definitely want to um, uh, water uh, those first couple of days uh, for sure. And then um, consider mulching. So to keep the soil nice and uh, rich and, and, and wet, you can throw some straw over your uh, transplants is a good, always a good idea. Um, in general, try to stay within those spacing guidelines that, um, that will, are spelled out on your instructions. Um, and in general, just try to keep your weeds in trick. Um, 
weeds, as we know, they compete for resources in your garden, your, um, you know, give, they give your plants some competition. So just, uh, just get rid of them for your, for your plants. Um, T, before you go on. Yeah. Can we just elaborate on a few of those really quick? Sure. I'm not uh, sure if I can go backwards. Here we go. Yeah, I got it. What are you um, thinking? Right. I just wanted to like emphasize with the sunlight and the watering, they're just a little more detail. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I just think that it, it may not be obvious to know like how to maybe obvious to some and not to others that uh, like how to how to know that you're getting enough sunlight. So that I mean, it really requires, especially if you're in a situation where there's buildings around or, or tall trees. Um, to really like kind of evaluate the site like throughout the day during the growing season because the sun moves through the you know the sun moves through the sky differently it's lower in the sky during the winter months and everything and you know so you know just to just to emphasize like you know it's worth like doing a little bit of an evaluation first thing in the morning on the spot that you're thinking of growing your garden and then you know coming back that eight to ten hours later and you know confirming that you're not getting shading and you know like it took me it honestly it took me a little bit to figure out some of the kind of nooks and crannies or like some of the spots in my own home garden just because of my garage and then my neighbor's house and a few trees that are around um that some spots just really weren't really growing very very well and that yeah. was because I, I was because of that shading and then the watering um just to emphasize that you're doing that watering um just a thorough watering one to two times a week. So watering can be kind of, uh, can be elusive. So you may, especially if the soil dries out a bit, you can water and just sprinkle a little bit and the top of the soil looks like it got dark and like you saturated the soil, but we really want that water to penetrate down into the soil. So it's worth like, you know, remember, stick your finger in it uh, and put your finger down in that soil, try and get it there two to three inches. Um, and 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 I and confirm that you're getting that uh, good saturation with the water. Yeah, yeah, I can second that notion. I have um, I when I first moved in this house, you know, I have two big trees. I have one big tree in the front and one big tree in the back. I contemplated, I contemplated, I contemplated cutting it down. I did <laughs> um, because I wanted more sunlight, but. I took like I took a whole year just to observe where the sun was in the different seasons, um, and then placed my garden before I really built out my garden. Um, uh, I really just had to sit and observe how that sun was hitting on that tree, and when you know when it leafed out, it looked totally different. And then you know, let me tell you this. So I went. There's this one little area that I thought was good. It was really good. I went and dug it all out, and had a couple rows in the back. And then my neighbor put, uh, hopefully my neighbor isn't on the line because I have a couple of neighbors <laughs> in the garden resource program, but uh, my neighbor put like a, uh, some like trellising up, like some, some boards that are trellising her plants in the back. And it totally shaded out the area that I just had pulled up. So anyway, it was tough. <laughs> <laughs> it was tough. so anyway things could change depending on neighbor yeah. gets a new fence or something like that so yeah word uh, word definitely keep in mind all right we can keep going then <clears throat> wanted to um if you're new to the garden research program if you're if you're an oldie then you know about hardening off plants we tell you this every year but if you're new to the garden research program you may not have heard of this um, concept of hardening off your plants all of those plants that you picked up already were sitting in the greenhouse for the last month, month and a half, and they have gotten spoiled. So they are not used to the air or the wind or the temperatures. And so um, we tell you to harden off your plants, meaning um, give them some time to acclimate to the outdoor, to the feelings outdoors. So that means that when you first pick up your plants, uh, keep them inside and maybe take them outside for a couple hours. And then the second day, second, third day, maybe leave them out uh, um, uh, you know, for most of the day and bring them in at night. Especially like we had some, we had some snow um, yesterday, bring them inside. Don't let them just sit outside in the snow because they're not used to that yet. So that um, 
and it's going to set them up to um, to be a little weaker than if you give them some time to acclimate. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. Let me know if there's any questions on that. There was a related question. Um, what to do with the strawberry plants we received? Should I yeah, put them yeah. in water or can I, until I can plant them or keep them dry? Yeah, we, we do have a slide on that. And, um, but to answer the question uh, really quickly, um, definitely uh, wrap them in, wrap the root in um, like some paper towel, some damp paper towel, not, not soaking wet paper towel, but damp paper towel, uh, wrap the roots. Um, I like to put it in like a plastic bag um, and put it in, the, you can put it in the freezer. I mean, the refrigerator, I'm sorry. <laughs> Don't put them in the Not freezer. Don't put them in the freezer. <laughs> Don't put them in the freezer. <laughs> sorry, the refrigerator. Um, and until you're able to plant them, but you want to try to plant them as soon as possible, as soon as we get past this snow, if you can get out there. Um, here's all of the things that you picked up um, or that you possibly picked up, depending on which ones you selected. Um, so we had seeds and transplants. And if you're new to the garden resource program, we like to give you things when it's time to plant. So in April, we give you a round of cold crops. Um, come May, you'll get crops that are hot crops. So all of these crops that you got right now are good to be planted um, right now. So um, you'll notice that um, something to notice, I always point out if you're brand new to gardening, um, kind of understanding the difference between cold crops and hot crops, um, one thing that stands out for the cold crops, if you look at this list, um, they're mostly leafy greens and roots, right? So um, I always like rule of thumb for me is if it's leafy, it's probably, um, <laughs> if, it is pro if I grow it for the leaves, it's probably um, a cold crop. And if I grow it for the roots, it's probably who need, can take a little bit of cold. Um, and then you'll see in May that your hot crop varieties are mostly fruiting varieties. Um, so uh, things that are tomatoes, eggplants, peppers, things that you eat for the fruit are um, typically need a little bit more sun and need a little bit more heat um, because they were, they're native to hotter environments. You know, I'm noticing a, <laughs> I'm noticing a little uh, typo there. They're, I think that the melon that was on that list is is going to co go out with hot crops. Just yeah, thank up. thanks for saying that. <laughs> I did notice that, and I asked. I said, "Wait a minute, are we giving melons out in April?" And they're like, "No, it's a typo." I'm like, "Okay, good." Whew. Um, yeah. So um, so we mentioned that for the seeds that you got, um, they all can be planted uh, right now in the spring. Um, you want to plant them in the spring. In fact, a lot of those seeds won't even germinate when it gets too hot. So sometimes you may, as a new gardener, you may, like I mentioned, lettuce. You may throw a pack of lettuce out there in June or July thinking you're doing something and it doesn't ever germinate because it was too hot for that seed to germinate. And you, you may think that it was something wrong with your gardening skills and it absolutely wasn't. It was just uh, that that particular variety does not grow, does not germinate even in the uh, in too hot of an environment. Um, yep. So like we mentioned, cold crops can take a little bit of freezing temperatures. So even if you did put a few things out before it snowed, um, they will they will be okay because they can take a few um, a few lesser degrees and um, and they like to germinate in cooler cooler soils. All right, so of those seeds, we talked about those leafy greens. Um, typically, leafy greens can be grown um, for the baby salad or for more mature um, uh, uh, head lettuce or um, varieties. Um, and then um, you want to, um, if you're gonna grow baby, you wanna plant them pretty de densely. So if you like the baby tender lettuce leaves, you want to um, um, plant them a little bit denser than you would for like head lettuce. Um, and then you're going to cut and come again. So if you're brand new to gardening, um, things like arugula, things like lettuce, um, spinach, and um, Swiss chard, if you're growing them as babies for babies. So you can grow Swiss chard as baby salad, or you can grow Swiss chard as those big leaves, right? 
If you're growing them for babies, um, oftentimes you can cut and come again and harvest. You'll cut and it'll grow again. Cut and grow again. You can usually do that two or three times. Um, and, and then- Can I add a uh, note about that? Yeah. Just, when you're, just to note when you're cutting, you're not cutting it all the way to ground level. You're cutting it to a couple inches above the ground. You're not, you want to make sure that the growing point, the young leaf that, you know, the baby leaf that starts at the center and gradually gets bigger, we don't cut that off. Yeah. Feel free to jump in, Keto, because I can't see your face, so I can't see when you, <laughs> when uh -huh. you have a point to make. So, yep, just feel free to jump in. Okay. Um. <clears throat> I'm but, sorry, could you repeat that, what you just said? For Okay, so we're talking about the cut and come again, the, the concept of growing things for small salad greens. And mm -hmm. you can do that with a lot of these varieties here listed. Um, so the way that the plant develops is it always grows. Um, oh, I wish you could see my hands, but. Uh, I can see them. I can see them. Okay. So, <laughs> There, from the center, there's a little point that grows up and then they grow up and then they grow out and then another inside of that, another, and they keep doing like this mm -hmm. kind of in the center. So when you're cutting it off at the baby size, you just never want to cut it too low because you're, you got to look for the little growing point where the smaller growth is and don't cut that off. So you cut around the perimeter instead of, you don't go ever go to the center. You just go around you don't always go to ground to the ground level. You always cut it like a couple inches above the ground. Okay. Observing for where that growing point is. You you kind of get a sense of it after a while. Uh, after you know after growing, like when you look at the plant, it'll be much more. I I would say much more obvious. But if you if there's ever on clarity, then you know you can always take a picture and we can and send it and email us and we can help you figure that out pretty easily. Okay. Um, yeah. While we have this quick break here, T, there was a question about, I can't plant my new crops for another one to two weeks. Will my plants be okay? Um, yeah, I would. Yeah, one to two weeks, you're going to be fine, I think. Um, and you may start to, for some like the kale and the kind of the leafier things, you may start to see that they may turn a little color. Um, and that's just because as they sit in those little pots, um, they're not getting, they, they, they want to get out. They want to get, they want, they want to get out. They want to stretch their roots and they want to, um, they're um, starting to get nutrient deficient in those little containers as they grow. So, um, so you'll notice maybe by two weeks, your kale may be getting a little bit purplish. Um, that's fine. Go ahead and pop them out and get them in the, in the, um, in the garden as soon as you can. Um, and I would uh, make sure you're watering them very well in those sales. You probably, you're going to want to, as long as they're in those sales, you're going to want to water them more than you would in the garden because they're, you know, they're contained. Anything in a container is going to need more water than if it's in, you know, touching the ground. Um, yep. So, so yeah, we were talking about this difference between like growing something for a full, uh, and I think a mustard green is a really good example. Like, there are people who grow mustard greens and, and toss them in their salad. So you would grow, if you're if you're growing mustard greens to toss in your salad, you're gonna grow the baby. You're not gonna grow, you're not gonna toss big kind of thick mustard greens in your salad, right? If you, if you want them to be like greens that you're gonna put in a pot, then you want them to be a little bit taller. So kind of knowing the difference of what you kind of want, what's your taste and what, what, what you want. Um, so if you want mustard greens to go in a pot, you're going to give them a little bit more space in your garden than you would if you if you um, if you're growing them for salad greens, then you can give them then you can plant them more densely. So I have a question. Makes sense. Yeah, I have a question. Sure. Uh, I have a question. Uh, when you put your uh, green, I mean your crop in the ground, when it's cold, how often should you water them? Once a week, if you don't get rain. Yeah, one to twice, once or twice a week. If you don't get any rain, I think the rule of thumb is one inch a week. And so, if it rains once, one good rain, you you should be fine. Now, I will preface that with saying that's once the plant is established. I'm talking. Um, about, I'm, I'm talking. About once you transplant your plants, you still got to water them at least once a week. If you don't get yeah. no rain, even and if it's cold. 
Yeah, a little bit more when you first put them in, I would do a little bit more and you can always do that finger test that, that Keto mentioned. But uh, usually when you first plant something, whether it's seed or, or the transplant, they need a little bit more water to get going. And then, um, and then once they're established, you, they don't, they don't need as much. So hopefully that makes sense. So as soon as you plant them, you're going to water them in very well, and then check them probably every couple of days to make sure they're not drying out. So the cold okay. water won't shock them? No. Okay. Nope. And you're going to be mostly, um, for the most part, you, that ideally, um, not everybody not everybody is able to do this, um, but ideally you want to be watering the, the ground around the plant and not necessarily the leaves. Um, so sometimes people put that sprinkler on there. And if you do that, you know, it's not, it's not a huge deal, but um, you can, you know, if you overwater the leaves, you can get some mildew issues here and there. Um, so for the most part, you want to be watering the ground and not the leaves. That makes sense. Um, and then all of these things that we mentioned, all these uh, kind of leafy greens have similar pest issues. So we'll talk about pest issues in further slides, but arugula, mustard, turnips, they all um, tend to have issues with um, flea beetles and, and sometimes aphids. All right, so, um, <clears throat> so some notes about the root crops uh, that are seeds that you picked up. Um, so you picked up um, the salad turnip, the regular turnip, the radish, the beets, and the carrots. Um, <clears throat> so some notes to some notes on that is that um, just to be mindful that since uh, they grow a little bit lower to the ground than other crops, um, you want to be mindful of what you're planting them near so that other crops don't shade them out. So we talked about them needing, you know, eight hours of sunlight, but if you plant them right next to a tall tomato plant, uh, you're, you're basically creating shade for them. So kind of <laughs> kind of keep that in mind, uh, the, the height that you're, that you're planting next to them. Um, root crops are generally seeded very densely. So that means if you look at your seed pack, it's going to say, um, it may say, what does somebody's seed pack say? It may say uh, three plants every inch or something like that, or three seeds every inch. And then what you generally do, with uh, root vegetables is you go back and you thin them out. So they may say, seed, put three seeds every inch. And then in a few weeks, once they start to germinate, thin them to one seed every inch. So that means that of the three that you put in there, you only want to leave one. Sorry, I didn't mean to put my middle finger up. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so thinning is a concept that, um, that you just kind of get used to. And um, uh, it's particularly um, asked to do that with, with, the, root, with the root vegetables. Could you, um, could you speak or speak to why, why do you would do that? Yeah, I mean, especially like, um, it's, it's one to ensure germination. Uh, so, uh, you know, it also has to do with um, spacing. So you, you, um, you know, they're root crops, so they need more space. So you could, you could um, plant, so say here's your bed, you could plant one every one inch, right? Uh, but if this guy doesn't germinate, then you have, you know, you have quite a bit of space in there. So, um, so I, I guess typically the method is just to go seed it very heavily, make sure they're popping up and germinate and then thin to the, the couple inches that you need. And that's just taking out the plants right. in between those, that inch. That makes sense? Yep, totally. Um, and one thing I, I just wanted to also mention was carrots. Carrot was one of my, my first crops that I grew and I really thought I was doing a bad, <laughs> I really thought I was a horrible gardener because they didn't ever come up. And I'm like, what the heck? But carrots can take a long time to germinate so uh, it may be good just for your own sanity if you're a beginner gardener is to um, just jot down the day that you went out there and planted some stuff. And then you can kind of know that you didn't do anything wrong. I know that my carrots are gonna take two weeks to germinate and um, I'm kind of expecting to see those uh, seeds pop out in two weeks. 
Um, and then that's when I would start weeding and everything like that. Once I know which one is my carrot seed, which works versus which one is, are the weeds. Um, some people have used this method of covering it up to, um, to seal in some of that um, moisture uh, and, and then kind of increases your germ period, germination period. Um, I've never done that. I just wait the two weeks, but I have seen that method um, at different farms. Can I say this about carrots? Uh, first time I, what you're talking about, I grew carrots, but I didn't grow them in a, uh, the proper soil because it was too hard. So my carrots would be, when, I, when they did, they did grow, but they were flat, you know, cause the ground was so hard. So this year what I did, I, I grew them in most looser soil. Then- that's, a, that's an extremely good point. So thank you so much for bringing that up. Like I said, if you've been gardening for a minute, make sure you bring up these good points because I'm definitely not going to remember everything. And that's such a good point. And I'm glad you said it, that that the root vegetables, um, you're going to want to grow that in the loosest soil that you have. So, <laughs> for example, if you if you like in my backyard, I have one area that's in ground up against my fence and I have one and I have a few raised beds. So I always put my root crops in my raised beds. That way they have the loosest kind of best soil to um, to give them that space to grow. So thank you so much for bringing that up. Um, hopefully that makes sense. Um, another thing uh, to just just to kind of keep in the back of your brain, um, uh, you know, these are all crops. Whereas the lettuce, you're gonna cut and come again. You're not gonna come again for a cure. You're gonna pull it and it's done. So uh, can you know consider. Um, consider six, what they call succession planting. So um, oftentimes what I'll do, like I mentioned my raised bed, I may do one row of carrots this week, and then I may wait a week or week and a half and do another row. That way, come time to harvest, I have, um, I have some harvest, I have some kind of staggering in my harvest, if that makes sense. <clears throat> okay. All right. And we got one herb variety, <laughs> excuse me, and that is cilantro. Um, the, let's see, what can I say about, um, uh, again, mm -hmm. okay, what Keto mentioned about that growth point, really understanding that growth point, you can kind of maybe see it in this picture, but you want to um, harvest at the growth point because you're going to keep, they're going to keep growing after that. Um, so they're going to grow more out of that growth point. So cut it at the growth point, And that's that part where the stem is kind of splitting. Um, you'll cut it right above that growth point. Um, let's see, you'll want to use the, in order for cooking, you want to use the more, um, the, the, the smaller, younger leaves. Um, those are the, the best flavor. Um, if you, you know, um, your cilantro will start to grow up like this. If you want your plant to grow more bushy and full, you can clip the tops and the plant will start to grow like this instead of growing like this. Um, I like to grow my herbs in pots and I put them all around the front of my house. <laughs> um, so I, I think the herbs are great to grow in pots. Um, and uh, note that your cilantro will start to bolt in the summer. You're not doing anything wrong. And when I say bolt, that means that the plant is starting to go to seeds. So they're gonna shoot up. Um, they're gonna uh, sh shoot up and in, into a seeded um, thing. And uh, just know that that's, that's, the, that's the life cycle of the plant. You can, you can clip those seeds to, um, to uh, prevent that a little bit, but that's the plant, that's the life cycle of the plant. Um, uh, oh, something to note, those seeds are called coriander, so you can keep those seeds <laughs> for seasoning in your car, in your kitchen. All right. I just want to, I'll just chime in one thing about coriander that I, or cilantro that I just find so curious, and I get, got to research this at some point, but I just think it's really interesting that it's something that's, you know, associated with, um, like, with hot climates like you know mexican food and, and yeah. indian food 
um but it doesn't like hot weather it's just that kind of <laughs> that is weird that is weird thanks for saying that yeah um okay another um another seed that you got were the snap peas <clears throat> snap peas are always the first thing i plant um <clears throat> i just literally drop them <laughs> almost when it's snowing but in march i usually drop a few in a in a container or wherever i'm going to grow them they're probably the most cold cold hardy um <laughs> plant in the bunch that you got um there are some uh, thoughts around um, how how you know you're going to go one inch deep with them. They're bigger seeds, so the, we know that the bigger the seed, the further down you're going to put it. You're going to plant it, um, and they are going to require some support. So they like to climb. So I just wanted to show you some pictures of these really cool. If you're a beginner gardener, you may not have seen these tendrils that come out on some plants, um, and this is what they're going to climb up your your fence or your trellis that you have. So just note that these will need some support and they like to climb up. Um, here's, yeah, here's, the, here's the pod okay. that you get and they have minimal pest pressure. What was the question? Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. She, well, there was a question, do peas really need a trellis or just a stick? Oh, what do people think? I usually, um, I usually put them up against my fence and they grew up in the fence, but have people just used the stick? I don't know. I, um, I well, know. I, it sounds like Marguerite, it sounds like you're, you've maybe done this, but if I've usually have some kind of trellis, the varieties that we grow are tend to be kind of, or I'm sorry, the varieties that the garden resource program distributes. Um, usually the ones that we choose are like, they don't, they're shorter varieties, so they don't, need a real extensive <laughs> trellis, but something to grow up onto. Um, Candace is saying she used a stick and it didn't work too well for her. Mm -hmm. But I think something horizontal off the ground is is going to be helpful. Even if it was like two sticks and some string, you know, some strings tied back and forth, weaved, you know, weaved back and forth, you can get a, you can get creative with it. Yeah. 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 But I mean, what, can I say this? Uh, it, it, on, the bamboo sticks that you put three together and that like a TP, you can use the sticks like that. But yeah. That you got to have, you got to have, uh, only one I know that I grew that I need a stick was the bush bean, I think. I don't know if you ever heard of the bush bean that grew in the yeah. bunch. Uh -huh. Yeah. I grew that, but I did do the three sticks one time, the bamboo sticks, <clears> and uh, they did pretty good, but you know, the bamboo stick wasn't tall enough, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I, I caught a little problem with that. But other than that, that you definitely gonna need a trellis something for them to clam on because they do get they do they do like to travel. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they do. Yes, they do. And I mean, you know, fun fact, if you if you're not familiar, those um those pea sprouts are very delicious, also. Very so. good. Very good. <laughs> they're, they're actually good in salads too. Yes, they are. I agree. So let's look at the transplants that you got. So you got some things as seeds, some things as transplants. And, um, you know, we can talk about like why we decide to grow some things as transplants. Generally, the things that we give you as seeds are um, either don't like to be grown as transplants or they're super easy to grow. Like peas are, are like probably one of the most easiest plants to grow. Um, so you might as well just throw them in the ground. Um, but things that um, we like to get a little jump on the season and grow them in the greenhouse for you, uh, your, all your brassicas and, um, and then the lettuce, leeks, and the celery. So let's take a look at each of these crops um, just to get a sense. So all brassicas are, um, and when I say brassicas, that's the family that um, that broccoli, cabbage, Brussels sprouts, kale, and collards are in, and then their cousin is the bok choy. Um, you, you notice that they all kind of have that similar taste to them, <laughs> the similar look to them, those large leaves. They're all in the same family, um, and they, um, they're all descendants of the wild collard. Uh, they're biennial. That means that they will go to seed in the second season. So if you were seed saving, 
or you're looking for the seed to grow, uh, the first year, you're not going to see a seed. The second year, so say you overwinter your, your, your collards, <clears throat> you're going to get that seed um, the second year. Uh, they all get about 18 to 24 inches high. So it's something to keep in mind when we're looking at shading things out in the garden. Um, yep, and so we mentioned that these are great to plant both in early spring and then in, uh, in late July for that fall harvest. So uh, planting another round of these in the fall is always a great idea. Um, they can tolerate the frost and, um, and even some, some freezing. Um, and they even become sweeter as, as all of my old school down South folks know that those, that those collars get sweeter um, with some cold. And they all have the common pest issues of aphids, cabbage loopers, and flea beetles. And we'll talk about those pests in a few seconds. Um, so the broccoli here, um, <clears throat> you're gonna uh, snap those heads <coughs> off or, um, or cut them when they're fully mature. Um, you'll see where this knife is. Um, cut, cut that head off on top of the, of the new growth that you're getting because you're gonna cut that head off and then you can also get these side shoots and these side shoots will continue to grow and you can get kind of a second harvest off of that, that one broccoli. Um, be careful with your broccoli, don't wait too long to, yep. um, it's kind of this perfectly timed thing with broccoli because you, you want it to get nice and exposed like this and then you don't want it to turn into a flower. So, so it's kind of this perfectly timed thing where you want it to be nice and mature and full. And then if you wait too long, these buds are gonna open up and turn into flowers. Um, again, avoid watering directly on the crown of the broccoli itself. There is some black rot issues that can happen when you overwater that crown. And I mentioned those smaller, smaller side shoots are always nice, kind of a nice addition. Another fun fact is you can definitely eat those uh, those greens of the of the broccoli just like you would collards. Throw them in the throw them right in the pot with the collards. Um, cabbage. I tell you what uh, I have done with the broccoli leaves: saute them. They're very good sauteed. Mmm, really? They're not too tough. No, but you, cause, cause you're gonna cut them up real small. They weren't too tough because I steam them in the uh, what they call it the smart pot. Mmm, that sounds good. Try that. I like mm. that. Um, they're actually like a, a delicacy in some in some parts of the world. So don't sleep on your broccoli leaves. <laughs> um, your cabbage. Uh, we know we're growing that for that that nice firm head that comes in the middle. And these are baby cabbage, so I didn't get that good picture. But we all have seen the cabbage patch, right? Um, <laughs> uh, you can uh, twist. I like to just slice it with a knife to make sure that I get that that cabbage head off. Um, and let's see, uh, you can also harvest those leaves um, as well around it. Um, and you see that, I'm gonna talk a little bit about pest prevention coming up, but you see, I decided to put a picture here of this white covering and that is the, the row cover. Uh, cabbage are, are really prone to uh, the, the, the cabbage looper <laughs> and <clears throat> you'll see those. And I have a couple pictures coming up of the large holes in the leaves of the cabbages and the, and the collars and those are cabbage loopers. So if you have that issue, uh, this row cover is something that protects that. And we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get into the pests, but Brussels sprouts are, they are a challenge to grow for me. Do you have good luck with uh, Brussels sprouts, Keto? You know what? I We budget our space and they don't make the cut just because they take up so much. <laughs> They're huge for one. They take a lot of space and they take a lot of time and you don't get a ton of harvest off of them. So That's a I love them. I mean, I totally, you know, it's, I really, really enjoy them, but I just... I leave that to people who more, you know, I'll just buy those from the farmer who's got a lot more space than I am and focus on the crops that, you know, that I have room for. And I, I think that's a good thing that I would just emphasize for others is like, you only have, 
so much space to work with and you have to make some cho hard choices sometimes. Good point. Um, they're, they're also, uh, I guess they also is a note is they, um, they're heavy feeders. So you have to like, you, you should think about some kind of fertilizer, organic fertilizer for them um, to really get a good yield. I mean, it's not out of, you know, it, it's not, you know, impossible, but they're, they're just on the range of uh, easy to hard crops. I would say they, they're slightly, uh, you know, slightly harder. Yeah. Yeah. I would definitely agree. Um, so you're going to plant these now. You're not going to harvest them so fall. That's another reason they get, they take up a lot of space and they take up a lot of space for a long time. Um, but the buds, they grow up against the stem like that. And so once you go to harvest it, sometimes you may see in the farmer's market that long, beautiful um, kind of stem full of Brussels sprouts. And so you, what you would do is just slice off these, you would slice off these um, leaves, leaving you with that long, beautiful stem that we talked about. Um, it's a hard variety. So if anybody has any tips in the comments, definitely if you've had success with them, uh, definitely drop them in there. Um, cauliflower is a new variety for us this year. So, um, so I'm looking forward to seeing some cauliflower, um, pictures <laughs> coming out, coming out from folks. Um, one thing about cauliflower, they're, they're kind of similar and I, I don't want to say this, they're not, they're not similar to celery, but, um, <clears throat> you do have to kind of cover that, um, you want to cover your head somewhat um so that it stays that that white head i'm going to show you this video of, of what they call blanching the head and when i say blanch we all know like blanching and cooking and this is a different different definition of blanching um but you want to kind of cover that head i'm going to show you this video of what that looks like um and then you're going to harvest it about two weeks after you uh after you go ahead and blanch it so let's let's cross our fingers and see if this video works <laughs> blanch white cauliflower so right about here we'll see this is a small head. This is a small, tight curd of cauliflower. And right now it's being shaded by the leaves, so it's still white. But once it gets a little bigger, it runs the risk of turning uh, green or getting uh, sprouts in between the curds, and we want to avoid that. So we're gonna tie up the head just like this. And you wanna make sure that you tie it loosely because you need airflow. Um, one major concern of tying up the heads too tightly is that you can get diseases from bad air circulation between the leaves. So you just tie it up like this and in about 14 days you can come back. I would periodically check it about once a week to make sure that it's not rotting. But in about 14 days you'll have a nice white head and it should be a nice tight curd. Um, and this is uh, something I just harvest. This has a, this is an ideal cauliflower. It's got a nice tight head and it doesn't seem to have too many pests. However, uh, sometimes you can find cabbage loopers hiding tight in the heads of these cauliflower. So the best thing to do is to soak this for 30 minutes in a very weak salt water solution, and that'll drive out any cutworms that might be hiding in the heads. Keto, how was my how was my YouTube? It worked great, perfect. Okay, good. <laughs> you know, it's always a it's always a toss out when you throw, throw a video on its own. It always seems like some delays or don't quite get the thing. All right, I put kale and collards in the same category because let's face it, they're very, very similar. Uh, they require the same spacing as most of the brassicas. Um, they have the same kind of growth pattern, growth size, same treatments to them. Um, something to note about both the kale and the collards is that harvesting <clears throat> uh, as you, as the plant grows, uh, you're gonna it's it, it it's gonna grow leaves coming out, and you're gonna be able to snap the leaves off, keeping the center intact because that center will grow up, and you can harvest those leaves, and you can do that for quite a long time, several months of harvesting the bottom leaves and keeping the center to grow high, um, bringing those bottom leaves into the house and cooking those up. Um, so you'll get that uh, continual harvest, um, and then if you're if you're an old uh, if you're an old school GRP member, you know that there's a, a heavy debate between 
the curly kale and the dinosaur kale. <laughs> you want to pop in the chat which one you like, the curly kale or the dino kale? Which one do you like, Keto? It's an application thing, but if I had to choose one, I probably would get do dino. Though that really? Would be a big debate in my house. It makes me change my whole perspective of you know. <laughs> I started off as a big curly kale. Me and my kids love kale is one of our favorite because we make the kale chips and all that. But I started off with curly kale. And then the last two years, I've been growing the dino kale because it's super dark and it just made me feel like there's more nutrients in it or something. And so I've been growing the dark, the, the dino kale lately. But yeah. let me know in the chat which one is your favorite. <laughs> um, yeah, I think choice. that makes sense for the chips the curly makes a lot more sense for the chips yeah it's a little bigger leaf um yeah but um but have the, anybody have anybody that would uh grow russian kale this is really good you oh, like yeah. the russian we, yeah. we, we used to we did russian a couple years so we may have to we may have to bring that one back oh, it's excellent yeah thank you um Yep, so if you're not familiar with the bok choy, here's what your, your final product is gonna look like. Some people, again, here's another crop where some people grow it for that, that nice, beautiful bok choy, you know, full bok choy. Um, and then some people harvest the leaves like we're talking about. So as it's growing, they harvest the leaves and, and, and cook those up individually. So it's kind of your preference, what, what you want. If you're going to market, you probably want that full. If you're going to market, you probably want that full bok choy uh, classic look there. Um, they have minimal pest pressure. So these ones are nice. Um, let's keep going. All right, this is the pest. This is the pest slides. <laughs> so if you are new to gardening, please don't be freaked out or deterred by the next couple of slides. But it is a fact of life that, um, that as you're out there gardening, um, you're wanting to eat the vegetables and so are other animals. <laughs> Uh, these, uh, if you see these along the backs of your uh, leafy greens, is particularly are super common. I think I get a bout of aphids almost every year. Um, uh, they are a soft-bodied uh, insect that are growing on the, usually I find them on the back of my leaves. Um, and let's see, the treatment, the treatment for aphids are to, um, I definitely, sometimes you'll have a plant where one or two of the leaves are like kind of infested with the, uh, the aphids. So I definitely snap, just snap those off if it's a bad infestation. I snap those off. You can blast a um, strong glass of water. So grab your hose, put it on the top setting and just blast those suckers off of there. Um, if you need a little bit more, kind of these are kind of in, 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 <laughs> in order of of need. So if you need a little bit more than the blast of water, some people will spray them um, with a, 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 deter a non-detergent soap mixture of water um, and or the, the cayenne. So the, the ratios are there, one, one teaspoon to um, of uh, Dr. Bronner's. It doesn't say in a pint of water. Sorry, <laughs> it doesn't say you how much water to put in there. Um, and um, in extreme cases, I've seen people use um, either flour right out of the cupboard. So you could dust them with flour. They, um, they kind of, uh, it kind of implodes their stomach <laughs> or the food grade diatomaceous earth, which is also a natural product. Um, you will definitely have to reapply both of those after the rain because it's just a dusting. You can dust those on the leaves and on the ground underneath. Um, and uh, long-term prevention, kind of think about, um, there's a couple of different things you can think about. Um, <clears throat> there are what you call trap plants. So planting uh, something that they like around what you, <laughs> what you plant. So they like these different um, particularly I, I use nasturtium around everything or zinnias around everything. They like those and maybe they'll go to those. It's kind of called a trap plant. Um, you have your repellent plants. If you're into like, you know, your companion planting, thinking about growing. Um, I am putting, I have started the last couple of years putting onions 
everywhere in my garden. <laughs> so I have onions like down the middle of all of my beds um, just to um, act as a repellent against certain um, certain um, pests. But um, all of the alliums, the onion, the onion families, um, catnip, chives, uh, garlic, and onion kind of serve as a repellent. You can think about um, attracting predators with um, some of your attractive plants like yarrow or clover. Um, ladybug is a natural natural predator to the aphids. So if you see the ladybugs in your garden, they are a beneficial. So do not do not disturb the ladybug. We love them because they are getting rid of the, the aphids. And then of course, just having good gardening hygiene. So removing the plants um, at the end of the year so that those aphids don't overwinter in your soil. May I ask a quick question, please? Sure. <clears throat> so with the um, cabbage loopers, I understand where they come from. I thought that those little white moths were friendly and beautiful, but not so much. Mm -hmm. I don't understand where the aphids come from. Can you, can you, um, do you have any insight around that? Like, how do they get in the garden in the first place? Mm. You know, like I said, they do overwinter in the soil. Um, other than that, I don't know. Anybody have an answer to that? Uh, I've never, I've never really looked into it. I mean, they're just yeah. one of those things that are, they just live in other places and you know they have a way of overwintering and i don't sometimes insects will have an alternate host or they have um or they'll uh have nesting and you know they'll have some kind of habitat that they live in during the winter months um so i, I guess that's an interesting point i mean maybe that would give you some insight on um on, on how to prevent them from establishing more, but their prevalence is is so strong in, in Detroit that I would say that in our region here, um, that I, I'm not sure that was much you can do in terms of prevention, aside from you know some of these practices that T was talking about. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I, so I, I, like for the, um, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, is it? I was just saying, is an interesting question. I'm definitely gonna research that a little bit more, but I think they're in the soil themselves. So. Okay, so the roll covers, that wouldn't necessarily be a prevention for them. Just try out the tips that you mentioned on your slide. Yeah, well, yeah. It depends on how you prepare your soil. I mean, it, you know, row cover is a good prevention method if you, um, so it's worth trying um, because maybe it's, if they're overwintering in, in the soil, like, and you turn the soil over beforehand, maybe, you know, and work it up enough, that maybe you're disturbing that habitat um, and then covering them with the row cover and then you're, pre you're preventing, you know, creating a situation that they don't get into. Mm -hmm. I find okay. it interesting, like that the aphids tend to like come toward the end of the life cycle of my plant. So it's almost like this natural thing that's happening that's breaking down my plant in a way you know like when my plant is on its last leg I feel like that's when my aphids are going crazy you know yeah um, but isn't it isn't that come from the soil because sometimes you use a micro uh, I use a guy I can't I was looking for it in my in my room where I couldn't find it but I I, I treat I brought it from my gardener channel and I spray it uh and the soil, you know, keep uh, blight down and, and, and bacteria down, you know, bad bacteria. Because last year I tried, it did pretty good. But what I have a problem with is spider mice. Oh, my God. Mm. I've never had a big problem with spider mice, but you're not the first person to tell me that. So Ooh. that's interesting. I didn't include a slide for them. So let's get through these and then I can ask the group if there's anybody who's still dealt with spider mice. Um, badly. Um, here we have in um, the, the woman who spoke before you mentioned those cab cabbage loopers and how uh, the middle 
is the the baby who makes all of this damage, this large leap, large hole damage. So sometimes you don't actually see the pests, you see the damage, <laughs> you see holes in your leaves, and you're like, what is going on? Um, and 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 like the woman mentioned, these this is the this is the mother or the parent of the of this of this larvae. Um, and so if you see these white flies, uh, white um, butterflies around your um, your brassicas in particular. Um, you're going to also want to look for the babies. Um, like she said, uh, she thought they were beautiful and then realized they were the, they were the culprits. Um, the treatment is really um, like, so like all of these treatments, you definitely can find, you know, harsher chemicals to, <laughs> to, to deal with some of these things. And we are definitely, I am definitely a proponent of um, using things that are um, biodegradable, that are, you know, not harmful to our planet or to our bodies or to our pets. And so, um, you know, I'm always a proponent for like natural remedies. So this is what you're going to see like on these slides. <laughs> but um, there are other like insecticides and things if you really, really are, um, you know, into that. Um, I just don't, I just don't prop propose those. You do, and this okay. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was going to ask a, a quick question about yeah. the overwintering. When you oh, when they overwinter, they bury themselves in the soil. Is that correct? Well, and you know, I just I just actually did a little more research because I was curious because I haven't really thought about it before. And it they, it says they actually over in the little bit of research I just did. So they they overwinter on host plants in and around the garden. So like other plants that you don't cut down it's probably a combination of all the things um but like they'll look they look for nooks and crannies lots of times you know even the insects that we like so that that's the that's the kind of the flip side of that is the insects that we like and we want to support and we want to be in our garden like like the ladybug for example also overwinter in that and and like material that's left up so we you know we, it, so the first point would be like, oh, they over, they overwinter in the in the leaves and stems of the dried out plants after they die back for the winter. I'm just going to cut all that stuff down. Well, that's also habitat for beneficial insects, so it's a kind of a catch twenty two situation. So I was asked, I wanted to know, I shouldn't dig up that dirt and throw it away. I should just leave it and kind of look for pests, and because I don't use pesticides either. Right. Yeah, you can't. I don't think that's uh, a very practical. It's not going to practically it's not going to work. You know, you, you can't replace your soil every year. That's just not um, it's not a very reasonable situation. And if you turn it over and stuff, I mean, I think, you know, what we're talking about here is there that pests on some level are a fact of life, which is a matter of managing them. Um, I guess one point that we haven't really discussed yet is like, you know, uh, or maybe we missed, but it just to reiterate it anyways, is that a strong, healthy plant is much more resistant to pests and diseases. So yeah. if we're doing all those things, we're making sure they have enough water, we're making sure they have enough sunlight, they, they were, you know, making sure that we're, we're, we know that they're getting enough nutrition, they look you know, you'll know because you'll look at it and it's like, wow, that looks like a really healthy plant. And that yeah. plant, you, uh, you you have that and next to a sick one, that sick one's going to get all the aphids, hands down. Mm -hmm. that's, one a, last, that's a really big point. One last question. Can you, if you don't remember what you put in a pot, can you put another crop in there or will, because I put some, but I planted a lot of things, but I didn't label the, the containers. So the dirt is good and I kind of picked stuff out of it. Can I just put whatever in there or should I just dump that? Well, not, you know, just next year, label the pots to make sure I replant the same things. Like I've got some oregano and it's still in there over winter, it just stayed there. But then I had some other things like I had sage and I had uh, basil and I'm not sure which pots they were in, so um, yeah, I, um, you, can, you can switch it up. 
Yeah, so it doesn't matter. matter. Yeah, no, it doesn't matter. Now, the, um, you know, some of your herbs are perennial. And so like the oregano is going to come back every year. So you want to, um, you know, the sage is also perennial. So maybe it died back. Maybe it, sometimes they die back because it gets a little bit too cold. But um, so if it's going to come back, you don't want to put anything else in there if it's going to grow out. But if it's something like basil that's not going to come back, you can, um, yeah, you can just put anything in there. And it, it's actually recommended that you put different things in, in di you know, that's called rotating your crops. So um, it's not a bad, bad thing at all. Okay. Um, all right. Thank you. Yeah, can, we not, talk not about row, can we talk about row cover? I'm not sure when you just have a few plants you want to cover and the other ones are doing well. How do you do that? I know that sounds weird, but I don't yeah, know I if do. I... Yeah, you want to put that row cover on in the beginnings. So are you saying like, because uh, once you have a problem, you wouldn't want to put the row cover on there. Is that what you're right. saying? Yeah, yeah, but if you only want a few of the vegetables have problems or might have them, how do you secure it? Just put stakes down or, you know, some of the vegetables we plant aren't susceptible to plant to pest in infestation. So do you just stake it over the few vegetables that do? Yeah, yeah. Like I'll do a whole bed of the same kind of crops that might need it. So I'll do a whole bed of brassicas and then put the row cover over that one bed. That makes sense. Um, oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Because I just have the little, the little boxes at the community garden. So I'll figure it out. Okay. I mean, you okay. might play around with, um, it's not quite the same, but you might play around with like making a little cloche out of a milk jug, like cut off the bottom of a milk jug um, when it's still small. I mean, I'm not sure if that would really apply and you'd have to definitely ventilate it from time to time, but yeah, maybe, maybe not. It needs to breathe. So, I mean, that's usually used like people, that's one thing that people have done, you know, during colder times and that could kind of be used for the same effect, but once it starts getting warmer, it's, it's going to get too hot, hot under that close. So it won't really be as effective for the pest prevention. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks. Um, yeah, well, and so, I mean, I think the major takeaway for the pest is to, we have one more pest to kind of look at, but it's to kind of monitor your plants, get in the habit of monitoring your plants, especially these ones that are prone, these leafy greens that are prone to different uh, pests. For example, here with the, the larvae, uh, you definitely want to remove these if you see them, but here's their, here's what their eggs look like. So if you're taking kind of an inventory of your, of your plants uh, out there watering, uh, you know, um, talking to your plants, <laughs> uh, you know, take an inventory, look under their leaves. If you start to see these different issues popping up, just go ahead and squash those, get those out the way, rub them off. Um, yeah. And then um, again, good hygiene, making sure that um, these are getting cleared at the end of the season um, is a preventative thing. So the, the last one that is really for the brassicas um, is the flea beetles. That's really common for the brassicas and the damage is more like these pellet holes as opposed to those larger holes. Um, and uh, you see these beetles here, they're, they're hard body. So they're, a, they're probably the harder, harder plant, a harder pest to control. Um, you can uh, dust the leaves with the diatomaceous earth that we talked about, again, using that full grade diatomaceous earth. Um, and uh, some people have had success with the neem oil. So here's a ratio for you, two tablespoons to a gallon. You don't need a lot. Um, and make sure you don't um, spray the neem oil in, your, in any of your flowers because that neem oil is not so good for the bees, but definitely on your leaves, um, uh, they don't like the smell of that neem oil. Um, you could consider, uh, if, if you're having a problem with flea, flea beetles, then you, you typically, if you have a problem with flea beetles in your garden, that's typically going to be a, 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 you know, a concern every year, you know, those flea beetles, what am I going to do this year for those flea beetles? So you may want to consider doing that trap crop. They love radishes. So maybe 
pop some radishes, you know, quick growing radish around your beds, have them get attracted to the radishes or the nasturtium instead of the plants that you're trying to save and harvest. Um, again, uh, start your season off. If this is a problem for you, if you see this every year, these buckshot um, holes, consider starting your season with the row cover and consider rotating your brassicas out of that bed and into another bed so that, um, you know, if there's anything overwintering in that bed, maybe we need to change and put a whole different plant family in the bed that, that, that the flea beetle doesn't like as much. So, so yeah. Um, <clears throat> you also got some lettuce. Um, again, you know, we, we mentioned with the lettuce, that you can grow them as, as whole heads or you can do the cut and come again uh, method. Um, it is always just a tip for the lettuce. It's always best to harvest the leaves early in the morning. They have this um, white um, substance that travels up the leaves um, during the day. Um, and that white substance is very bitter. So if you harvest these during the evening, you're gonna, your lettuce is gonna be bitter. So if you find that you're you find that everything you harvest out of your garden, your lettuce is bitter. Try harvesting more in the morning. Um, and then also these um, are very prone to bolting. Uh, you know, as the as as it get as it gets warm outside, I mentioned this lettuce does not the, the life cycle of the lettuce is to is to grow, to grow ahead, and then to um, grow a seed. That's just the life cycle and, and to die. And so this, this is an indication that the plant is, uh, you know, heading into its maturity, creating the seed. And um, just know that that's part of the life cycle. And it happens as, as, the, as the weather gets warmer. We'll plant another round in the, um, in the fall. All right. And the leaves will be super, super bitter by the time this bolting happens. <laughs> Um, yeah, and I would say just a, a note on that is similar to the broccoli, um, you know, and this is like, this, this actually reminds me of when I first started gardening and we, I was growing some romaine lettuce, just like in that picture <laughs> and it looked beautiful. Well, before it got to that picture, right. It looked beautiful. Uh -huh. It was like, it's, it, it looks like the perfect head of romaine lettuce that I, that you'd see at a store. <laughs> and I was like that and, and, the and next I just day kind of both. looked at it and I didn't know like you know it just didn't it was like oh it's great it looks look at that lettuce it's great and then it didn't hard I just looked at it and the next day and the next day I never harvested and then it bolted like this right so I lost yeah. that opportunity so it's like when it looks you know it may seem kind of silly or or obvious but when it looks like you know it's supposed to look then that's you should harvest it then don't wait because <laughs> you're going to lose your opportunity. I've, I've, I've definitely done that more than once. Keto, I ended up having too much. So just give it away. Just give it to people and right. put it in your smoothies if you can't do all those salads. That's all. Right. That's great. So before it starts bolting, you just pull the whole plant up or? Yeah, it's done. You're not going to. Yeah, basically you, you, you let us. So like with uh, uh, with the cabbage, um, like with the cabbage, it, it was something you could actually snap off the head and leave the outer leaves and it would send up little side shoots. But with, with both of these, with the lettuce and the cabbage, it's kind of a choice point. Like if you're planning on growing other things or you wanna you know, diversify, that's a great opportunity to harvest it, pull out of the ground. Now you have some more open space in the garden that, to plant the next thing. Like, I uh, really want to emphasize that the concept that you don't have to, you know, plant a garden all, uh, you know, all at one time and that's it. Um, and uh, yeah. Yeah, that's really good. Okay, thank you. All right, let's look at celery. Um, celery is one of those trickier crops, I will say. It definitely needs a lot of moisture, as you can imagine for those stalks to uh, develop properly. Um, you want to um, you want to harvest when those stalks are you know, at least eight inches, but uh, you wanna do this blanching technique 
um, I didn't do this last year when I, <laughs> last year I didn't do the blanching and they definitely were white, whitish. Um, and they kind of, they didn't grow up like this. They kind of grew out like this. <laughs> um, so, you know, this is a technique that, that people use. You can use pretty much anything that will um, kind of cover those stalks um, away from the sun, give them some shade, and that'll get you your nice green, uh, strong, upward growing <laughs> uh, celery stalk. All right, and keep the, make sure you keep the leaves out because that's, that's what's grabbing that sunlight for your plant. All right. So, so you somebody go back to that slide for just one second. I wanted to take a picture of it. Thank sure, you. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. And um, Keto will send you these slides after the class. So it don't feel like. Oh, you to, uh, oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so, 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 take so, rigorous notes. So you can't <laughs> grow your celery in direct sunlight? Yes. Yes, you will. Um, but the, so the leaf, the leaf part needs that sunlight but the stalk um if it gets too much sunlight it, it 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 doesn't get that nice green stalk that you're used to seeing in the grocery store it'll be much more so like we're used to you know um it, a milder flavor maybe slightly more i don't know i guess watery so to speak if you let it if you don't blanch them or you they get a lot of sun they'll be really green and it'll just be a much more intense celery flavor. It's not like it's unusable, but it's just, if you want the celery that you're kind of used to eating, um, that's this is the move. Uh, this, a question, any pests to look out for with celery? Celery is low press, pest pressure. Yeah. I screwed up last year and I put the bag over the entire celery plant it turned out out well but i'm like i know i do something with the paper bag and dave the garden manager said okay then it still turned out well but now i know what to do but i just knew to use the paper bag but i didn't and i tied it with a rubber band so everybody you might want to tie it with a rubber band or something but like you said not over the top That's it great. still tasted it tasted great and it was a prettier, deeper green than in the store where it seems to be filled with too much water or too pale in the store. But yeah, don't do what I did. <laughs> Thanks for that experience. I appreciate that. Somebody mentioned the strawberries and what to do. Uh, same thing with the leeks and the strawberries that you got. We want to plant those as soon as possible um, because they can die out um, pretty easily. But if you need a couple of days, definitely wrapping them in that damp paper towel, like we talked about, putting them in plastic and putting them in the refrigerator does help. Um, uh, you know, leeks are one of those crops that, you know, you may not be as familiar with. So I wanted to, you know, share a picture with you. And then there's a particular way, especially if you're harvesting and you want it to look pretty for market, that you want to cut those. Um, so I wanted to show you this video of of that, um, let's see, yeah, let's go ahead and play the video. Here, this one's ready, this one's ready, but this one's not ready. So what I'm gonna do is start pulling them out and show you what to do. So we pull the leak out like this, and you're gonna see there's a lot of soil on this and a couple of stragglers. Now, if I wanted to replant these, I could, but basically what I'm gonna do is just shake off the soil and that leaves a lot of roots and a lot of kind of dirt around the end. So all I have to do is peel off this outer layer like this. And voila, perfectly beautiful leeks, just like that. Now to further clean this up, I can take my pruning shears and snip off all of these roots like this or some what some uh, people yeah. do which is kind of cool <laughs> cut the roots off with a little bit of the bottom of the plant and replant it because leeks will grow from that green onions will too it's kind of magic now with the green end now you usually don't use the green end in cooking so you can trim that off you can do it like they do in the supermarket where you cut it on an angle like this and like this my 
because pruning shears need a little sharpening. And voila, leeks. <laughs> okay, yeah, I just want to show you that little fancy cut if you're uh, not familiar. And definitely if you're taking it to market, that is what you're looking for to go to market. And then as with all onions, you are slipping. If you're using, if you're eating these at home, we'll cut that bottom off and stick it in, in the window with uh, a little bit of water. And you're gonna get some more leeks. And I do that with my green onions too, like she mentioned. Um, so yeah, just to uh, just to mention, so you don't miss the- Here, here. <laughs> this one's ready, the this one's one. ready, but this one's not ready. So and the strawberries, I think is the last, while we're talking about so strawberries in general there's two kind of uh families of strawberries one is the june bearing and one is the ever bearing um so i believe that the variety we have are ever bearing um that means that they'll produce from may to august um if they were june bearing obviously they they do a big they do a big showing in june and then they're done um, so that's kind of a personal style, just, just something to note when you're strawberry shopping. Um, you're gonna, uh, trim off any, anything dead. Um, and then once you plant them, kind of be careful for your soil, um, your, your planting depth here. Um, you don't want to go too deep and you don't want to go too shallow because that's going to dry out the roots. Uh, you don't want to go too deep or else you're going to, um, be in a little bit of trouble. So you want to get it right kind of right, right even with the ground there. Um, the first year, this is gonna make some people cry, but the first year <laughs> you wanna pick that flower. Of course, the, the berry is gonna come out of the flower, but pick off your flowers in the first year. That's gonna really encourage um, encourage that, um, that kind of that, that plant growth and that root um, establishment. Um, so for the first couple of rounds, pick off your, your flowers. Um, and if you're not familiar with strawberries, strawberries have these runners. So they shoot off. And there's a few plants that do this. Um, you might be familiar with like those spider plants. They <laughs> shoot off that purple. Um, mm -hmm. They have a purple runner. Um, strawberries have this runner. So they, they'll shoot off this runner and then blop, another plant comes up. <laughs> and that is how they propagate themselves um, so by the end of the season, you can end up having lots of strawberry plants. So don't be afraid to uh, prune those down or to share strawberry plants with your friends. Um, and um, after production is over, you can go ahead and mow those down and strawberries are perennial. That means that next year you can mow all of that down, keep the roots in the ground, and they're going to pop up in the spring um, again. So um so yeah, I think that might be our might well be our question last. about uh, question about uh, strawberries. We yeah. will get fruit from the strawberries the first year though, not the second year. So versa. So if we plant the strawberries this year, will we get any fruit this year or wait until next year? What did you I'm say, Kito? Uh, well, she was saying. She, this, I mean, maybe she misspoke, but she said that she wouldn't get, she would get fruit this year and not next year, where it's, you're trying to not get, you're trying to basically pick off the flowers um, to in, in this year to encourage root growth so you get fruit next year. Yeah, and you'll likely get some uh, this year, you know, but you know, it's kind of a, it's kind of a sacrifice if you want a strong, like if you want to establish a strong strawberry bed, um, it's just kind of best practice. You may get a few, like particularly those first few flowers, and let the let the plant take some time to really establish the roots, um, and then maybe toward the end of the season let those grow out if you if you'd like a few this year. But um, you know, that's just you know that's just a that's just best practice. You don't have to listen to me. <laughs> you can definitely get your get some strawberries this year. Um, and see how it oh. goes. Okay, I want best practice. Okay, thanks. All right. <laughs> All right. Okay, well, we got some. We got some questions that I held off because for because we I figured we have some time. Yeah. Um, so what first is more of a statement, um, and this is Marguerite was was just making sure she put had a really good point about 
um, when you're getting ready for, since we're planting our cold crops now, is to be thinking ahead about space. So like you got hot crops coming in about a month or less. And so don't fill up all your beds with all your hot crops and seeds because you got more stuff yet to plant. And I, I would probably wager to bet that you want to make sure that you have some room for things like tomatoes and peppers and and things of that sort. So um, thanks for, such a good point. Thank you. Thanks for bringing that to light, Marguerite. And then uh, there was a question about soil and soil type and like what soil do you need or or should I should should I buy was the question. Um, so do you want to talk to that, T? Yeah, well, I think it really depends on, are we talking raised beds? Are we talking in ground? Are we talking containers? Uh, if you're talking containers, you definitely need a potting mix um, that has those uh, little white uh, vermiculite in there that gives you some space in there. Uh, for raised beds, there's a couple different methodologies out there. I like to use... Um, uh, a compost topsoil blend. Uh, some people would go straight top compost. Um, you know, some people like to do a raised bed kind of mix. Um, there's a few online. Um, and then if you're going in ground, you just definitely want to add compost every, I like to add, you know, a few buckets of compost every year into my existing soil. Although, because my neighbor put the trellis system up, I don't have very much in ground <laughs> in my backyard. <laughs> um, yeah, anything uh, else? Were you, were you referring to the perlite? Yes. Yes, I'm sorry. Yes. Perlite. The, yeah. the little white balls? Yeah, it's called right, perlite. I said, I said vermiculite, sorry. Perlite, yeah, yes. But they do Thank have vermiculite, vermiculite and perlite together. Well, I do that when in my ground saw. And Keto, you got to call Mr. Carter about those uh, fruit trees you probably call yeah. me. Yeah, yep. I, um, actually, uh, you're on my list for tomorrow. Let's talk. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> and I want, I, I, you know, I wanted to, uh, can I, can I say, I wanted to show you this thing y'all was talking about coming down. I brought it from Amazon and I, I want to show it to you if I could turn my camera around what you was talking about. Hold on one second. Oh, come on. You see this little like umbrella thing I brought? It's like you can pull it to cover your plants like that. You, can you see that? Ah, yeah. Oh, yeah. That'll that'll work in my smaller plot at the community garden. Thank you for yeah. sharing. Yeah, Amazon. They like, okay, they like thanks. You get like, yeah. you get like 12 of them for like $15 or something like that. What okay. are they called? What are they called? I call them my brother. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean on Amazon. Just I don't. I, I, I just picked them up and and they, they fit over my little plants, you know, for keep the bugs out and stuff like that. Yeah. And if you look I, for food you cover, for your picnic. When you have your picnics outside, that's what they use to cover up your food. Yeah, similar to that. Yeah, exactly. Right. right. Let, me see I, let me see. Can I open it up so that you see how it really looks? See when you open it up. Oh, okay. Maybe a garden netting or something like that. Okay. Yeah, she was right. They they can be used that for for the food, cover the food. But I use them to cover my plants up. Okay, I'll have Especially to check. Especially when they're young. Right, right, right. Mr. Carter, I'm looking around your house. It looks like you like plants, sir. <laughs> oh no, oh no. Let me. Let, I got. I got to show you my little, my, my little uh, <laughs> what I'm proud of. And, and, and I know it's going off track, but you see this? This is called hibiscus. Woo oh, I want some. I want to grow. <laughs> and I actually grew for seeds. I'm so proud that I, I was shocked they grew so well. Nice. How long they been growing? Since January. Wow, oh. that's impressive. And you got the lights going. I see and you, this Mr. is that uh, lip lip what they call lip pine, Russell lip pine that grew that oh. from seeds too. Nice. I got lucky. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. I just got lucky, that's all. <laughs> but I ain't have no skill like that. I said, okay, sometimes you get lucky. Are you going <laughs> to plant your hibiscus outside or are you going to keep them inside? Because they get to no, be pretty big. No, I'm, I'm, I'm planting them outside. I got I got three outside already. I'm kind of addicted to them, so. 
Yeah, they're so good for you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. See, I got a question about this perlite. Do you kind of like mix it in the soil or just keep it on top of the soil? No, you mix it. Yeah, oftentimes it's, it comes in the mix. But yeah, you can buy it separately and mix it in. Can okay. I show, can I show the bag? Sure. I have it. I already have it. I don't. I just didn't know what to do with it. Yeah. I mix it, I mix it with the soil, with the, uh, the other, I mix it with the soil and the compost in, in the ground. I don't put can it I in see? my bed. Okay, can I see the bag again? Yes, ma'am. Oh, bigger room. okay. That's the cheapest. <laughs> okay, it works, right? It works great. Okay, that's good. It, it improved the draining and the aeration of the, uh, your soil. Okay. Yeah, definitely for your pots, you need something. Yeah, I got pots. That, pot, that potty mix that has those little white balls in there that gives you that space that you need. Yeah, Mr. Perlite. Got, perlite. Get that got, little ball, the perlite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've got some big uh, ceramic pots and the drainage is not that good. And I put some stuff in there. Um, what kind of drill? I asked a friend to put a drill to the um, ceramic pot to try and that wouldn't break it. Do, does anyone know how to get holes in a large uh, you ceramic buy the, pot? You, yeah, you got to buy a mason drill for masonry. mason drill? Okay. Yeah, it'll drill it. You can't do it with a wreck, but the mason, the, the mason one, it, it don't have a sharp edge, it got a flat edge on it. Okay. So, the mason drill to drill it. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Well, we're going to talk somewhat about composting. I got this composter last year and it's put together now. And I didn't <laughs> know how to start with it. We're going to have a class all about composting this Saturday. Oh, okay. What time? It's at one o'clock. Uh, same, same place. Okay. okay. Cause wow. I, 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 got, I got I got a big one. I got I just ordered a big one, a hundred sixty pound one from uh, and I put it together and and I don't know nothing about composting, so <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I, I'll be I'll be on the line this Saturday. <laughs> okay, yeah, our friend Ross is going to be teaching. He's great. Okay, good. Awesome. Okay. All right. Um, so yeah, I mean, like a few other things I just wanted to touch on. There was some questions about like, what should I be growing in ground versus growing in raised beds? Um, I mean, root crops in the raised beds, I would say if you're trying to make a decision. Right. Um, there's nothing that, you know, needs the raised bed per se, it's just, Right. You know, using that looser soil for those root crops, I would say. Right. Um, yeah, you'll you'll find you'll find your rhythm of what you what you like to what everybody kind of does it a little bit different. <sighs> the raised bed rhythm. is better for your back. <laughs> it is. Yeah, we'll Good you. point. Like for me, I'm learning. I like to grow my tomatoes in my pots. I was I tried to grow them in my raised bed, and I. I prefer the pots, so I just keep growing in the pot. In the pot. And uh, but you know everybody's got their personal style. I grow really good tomatoes because I get okay. like eight, eight to twelve hours worth of sun a day. I bet you do. And see, I got that big tree in the back, so I gotta place them in the right. Maybe that's why I like the container because I can put it right where I need to put it <clears throat> yeah. to get all that sun. Tomatoes. Well, I really appreciate you guys' time and hanging out with us uh, this evening. Is there any other questions in the chat that we didn't make it to? I feel like we more or less got to everything. Um, does anybody else want to, for the good of the order, have any questions or anything that's on your mind? Do we do we answer all your? No, it, it was very nice. It was very informative. I learned I a lot. I put a question out there about the plastic pots. Do you suppose to punch all the holes in the bottom or just some of them? Uh, 
Well, all like there's an option to have a lot or a little. Cause see, I have like the long, the long ones. Then I have the round ones, and I didn't know if I supposed to be punching all those holes that's in there. Yeah, the I did. I, I did the long. You talk the long like for the legs. You put the legs the real long. They can sit on the porch. Right, 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 right. I punched all mine. <laughs> I'm okay. like, she was, I wasn't sure, so I say, well, what can it hurt? <laughs> <laughs> that's what. <laughs> Because that's what I, I didn't know if that was the protocol to do yeah. wrong. I, I think that's a, every other one. I think Jeffrey pretty much hit it on the head there. Like, as long as you're not, the soil's not falling out and you have something from holding the soil from falling out, then you're good. I agree. And keep in mind, those containers are going to need more watering than right. your in ground. Right, right, right. Because I had, I was putting some rocks in there to give it some air. Yeah, yep. Or, or okay. so, yeah, rocks will work, yep. Okay, okay, I'm good, thank you. Yeah, okay. Maxine, you got your hand up? For growing, or is it certain types of plastic you can use? I'm sorry, say that one more time. For plastic, like for your pots, are you able to use plastic? Like I've been seeing mixed reviews on it, on the internet. It's, I've been growing in plastic for years, it's fine. Oh, okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hey, Keto, I just wanted to show you some dried cilantro from our garden. They made nice. it into a sculpture. Nice. And then I took a photo and it got into an art exhibit in a sapia tone. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> Beautiful. Um, sorry, Maxine. Go ahead. Did you have a question, Maxine? I'm sorry. Yes, I did. I didn't want to over talk anyone. That's okay. Um, I had a question about, so, okay, so I've been growing for several years, but last year, for some reason, it's like the soil was out of control with all these weird bugs and things that never were issues before. Last year, we had so many squash plants that we were excited about, and these squash bugs killed every, almost everything. We had loofah, we had, you know, spaghetti squash, everything just slowly just started dying. Um, it just sucked the life out of the plants, and I, we tried... So I'm able to get pests taken care of. Other pests, we, we successfully take care of it. But that one, we tried neem oil. We tried everything possible. We picked them off, threw them. We squashed them. It, did, it just didn't work. And so I wonder, I'm concerned about that this year because we want to grow a lot of squash this year. And that was the thing that defeated us. <laughs> so... And so I wonder, is there something that I can do this year if that happens again? Yeah, I, I, um, I would say um, maybe when I mean, you say a whole bunch, was it, was it overcrowded in there? Because that can cause more pest pressure, I think, too. Um, it could have been. Um, maybe the giving them a little bit more space so they're not kind of on top of each other is one thing. And then I do, I have seen people for the squash use that. Um, have you, did you try the diatomaceous earth? Oh yes, we tried the diatomaceous earth for sure. That didn't, it did not work. Um, and have you heard, have you heard of BT? BT. Yeah, it's kind of natural too. Uh, I got it from Amazon, and what I did with my squash, like watering, you know, the big, you know, the, like the uh, where you get the uh, almond milk in the little square things. What I did, I put a lot of holes in those, and I buried it in the ground with that. And I watered through that. So the less water on the plant. So what I did, I buried that next to the uh, squash and I watered that instead of, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's like a powder, right? Me, no, what, the way I did mine, it's called BT. It's natural too. And I right. got it from Amazon, but how I did mine, the guy was telling me that sometimes the overwatering would cause a lot of things. So I buried this thing and then I put like like 30 holes in it. And it's got, you know, it's got the little screw top on it. So uh, uh, when, I, when I water, I just watered that and it watered the plant. I never put water on the leaves of the plant. I just um, watered yeah. it. So okay. it's really we had a lot of rain last year where it was just yeah. drowning from the rain. Yeah. 
Um, so you could you couldn't win that one. <laughs> but you know, I this brings up two points that may that that you guys both kind of referenced. One is for some crops, there's just like good years and bad years. Um, yeah. <laughs> so like I you'd be like, I don't like I had a great squash crop last year, but this year it's just terrible. And then that doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna be the same, like because the life cycle of that pest and like maybe they just the last winter had a more favorable overwintering for them and their life cycle so they were able to become more robust and then the other part of it like you know i said i think squash bugs are one of those ones that are, are a little bit challenging to work with mm -hmm. um, i didn't look at the list for bt bt is definitely a, a useful for a lot of pests and it's like this thing that gets it's basically a microscopic um stuff that gets in their gut and it makes them unable to digest and then they, they die because of that um uh but hand picking so like being super proactive and going out and sounds like you were doing that but that would be the, the, and other than that i think that's either that or you can and then you know t was referencing earlier like heavily infected plants or heavily infected uh leaves uh removing that and disposing of that so those would be, all be, you know, some strategies to work about. So space. Yeah, also look look for their eggs in the spring, because um, you can if you if you if you kill the eggs before the because they they're not gonna pop out to that warm weather top top. I don't ever see a squash, you know, in the colder weather. But they yeah, will. but you know, but you know, I never grow squash in the in the summertime. I always wait to the fall to grow it, and I I never had a problem. Oh. I never grow it. I never grow it in the springtime. In the summertime, I wait till but just about maybe July. All I mean, not July. I'm talking about maybe by the end of September when I plant it. I get a lot of it. I had a whole lot of butternut squash, and I did mine sooner than later. So I don't know. Yeah. I just, it just went crazy. It just went crazy. It's yeah, but we did, we did get a lot of rain last year. <laughs> a lot of rain. What's that? Um, that cartoon of that? Is it the rooster or something? They're like always fighting in the garden. Like I just feel like <laughs> I just feel like it's always like a constant, like yeah, a constant yeah, yeah. battle, right? You just gotta, <laughs> yeah. you gotta just yeah, like Keto said, you have some years where because there's things. <clears throat> it's odd, like nature, nature. Because like, you know, some people say like years where, say like an oak tree, if you have an oak tree, there's certain years that you get a, a lot of uh, acorns, right? More than you would usually get, right? And there's like some kind of way that nature is doing that so that it, um, you know, it, it is preventing something else. It's like this whole balance that's happening, right? <laughs> like, and I don't know. So maybe try again, maybe try a different area of the garden if you can. Maybe try giving them a little bit more space. Try looking for the bugs earlier, the, the babies on the leaves, the, the uh, eggs on the leaves, squashing as many of those as you can. And maybe even putting some um, alliums or some mint in between. Oh, you know. okay, that's that's a good idea. Actually, I'm in, this was in Canada. I'm now in Detroit with my husband. So it's a totally uh -huh. different garden, which oh, okay. makes us. Um, <laughs> but- Thank God. <laughs> yeah, you know what? <laughs> in both ways because it was a 500 square foot garden and i was so proud of it we, we you know in the city and now we have a really small backyard so we're trying to figure out space right now so it's kind of mixed emotions but definitely a new start um my other my other contingency was maybe we can grow it hydroponically i've seen people grow squashes hydroponically and figure i figured that might help with that whole issue but i still have to look into it because i'm not really a hydroponics um kind of grower so I hope I you have a class please, for that. <laughs> are you, are you yeah, talking about growing indoors? No, I, uh, you know what? I have to look into it. I've seen people yeah. grow hydroponically in bins, you know, where they, it was pretty, yeah, where they had cucumbers outside, I believe, in a bin where they had six in one of those big kind of bins that you get at Walmart. And they had such an abundance of cucumbers that way hydroponically. So I wonder if, we can maybe try that this year. Are we going to try that and see? Can I ask a question? Sure. 
Okay. Uh, concerning what the young lady was talking about, I had that same issue last year. And last year was my worst year. This is my seventh year gardening, but last year was my worst year. Worst year. What I did Okay. What? Right, Janice, I keep muting you. <laughs> yes, I'm the new guy. Okay, what I'm, I mostly did last year is something I don't normally do. I went into the big box stores and I got plants last year to go with what I already had. Usually I go to Eastern Market, but last year I, I feel like I brought in more pests into my garden because I've never seen uh, that, that little green tomato hornworm thing. That was the first year I ever seen it. First year I ever had it. And I saw more bugs, more pests in my garden last year because I went and pulled things from the big box store as opposed to going with the farmers. Could that have created a problem for me? As far as, especially I noticed it with my squash. It was like the flowers were coming up, but as soon as they came up, they were gone. Uh, and I, I couldn't figure out what had happened. And That's my tomatoes was being stripped left and right. Mm, oh, I your think, squash, uh, did, you have, did, you have, did you have a lot of uh, flowers? Because you know, it's got to be pollinated. If they're not pollinated, they're gonna fall off. Well, I had it like in the, um, uh, I had my greenhouse, but it usually stays open. So I have bees that are coming in and out. I have okay. different butterflies that are coming in and out. Okay. And But it was being eaten. I could tell it was being eaten from the root, you know, and it was just coming up through there. And so what I did, I, I just took that, that out from away from everything else. And I just refused to use that at this point. But what I'm going to do, I'm going to sift through that soil this year. Um, and see if it's salvageable. But I believe my problem came in was when I brought in um, the plants from the big box stores like Lowe's and Home Depot. And normally I wouldn't do that, but I did. Right. And it was like an infestation that went through all of my crop. And I was so hurt. And I'm like, mm. I, I didn't understand what was going on. So could that have been a problem there? Could it have come in that way? Because I put them in separate pots, but they were still in the vicinity right. of right. all of the other plants. So I would say, um, I mean, it's, it's never a bad idea to inspect your plants top to bottom before you plant them to make sure, even when you get them from us, honestly, like to make sure that you don't, there's not, you know, an aphids on there. You know, we're talking about the, talking about nature here, like bugs, you know, things find a way. Um, but to have, you know, I, I, what I, what I hear you saying is like, okay, I've been gardening for a number of years now. And now all the, everybody's starting to know that I got the goods. <laughs> and, uh, okay. and they figured it out they figured it out where where you know that i got some good stuff and and they're and they're coming through and I, I think that's a phenomenon like oftentimes if your garden is brand new your first couple of years are going to be the the you know can be the bangers those are the ones that do really really well and then yes you know part of the pest and everybody starts to like get figured out and you have a population there that you have to contend with. Well, there's not much you can do about that. You can't dig out all your soil. You can't put it all, you know, you, you can't keep nature out. So at that point, you just have to like, you know, manage the, manage them it, at one at a time. Uh, so you I know, Keto, been... Keto, I'm not cutting you off, but I'm going to say, I tell you this, you said something very powerful for me because the first, I've been about seven years like young lady have, in the first two years, I grow the best greens, the best yes. tomatoes. Yes. And, and, and so you're absolutely right. <laughs> so, I mean, and the other indicator there might be that you need to 
think about like refreshing your soil, bringing in some more compost, bringing in some new fertility, like, That's what I was thinking. And, and don't, don't, uh, you know, don't shy away from the organic fertilizers. Look for things that there are some granular organic fertilizers that you can find at some of the big box stores. Now mm -hmm. just look and, you know, you don't want like big numbers. You want more like a five, five, five or something like that, but look at mm -hmm. that label and look that right. it's intended for it's organic one and two that it's intended for vegetable growing and uh mm -hmm. sometimes those bags are a little bit confusing in my taste i feel like they make it harder than it needs to be but um, yeah and so in my research what i'm finding is i didn't have any type of flowers in there and there are certain flowers that detract these these things, <laughs> you know, all these different pests. And I said, okay, so this year I got nasturtium, I got zinnias, you know, so I said, okay, I'm gonna plant some flowers in and out and around. And I love putting onions in there because a lot of them don't like the onions. They don't like the chives, they are too strong. So I said, okay, I'll do that. So it's almost like you have to build a fortress for your garden. <laughs> in order to have anything salvageable. So in my research, this is what I'm seeing. Yeah, that's great. That's great. And you know, you know, for folks who are new, what Keto was saying, that, that was my thought exactly. Like, you know, at, you know, as your plants, you know, every year they're 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 taking nutrients from the soil. And so you want to make sure you're replenishing that. Right. Okay. So, and, and, and like Keto said, like the stronger your plant is, the just like our bodies, the stronger your plant is, the more it can resist um, and has its own defense, right? Its own immune system. Mm -hmm. um, so the more nutrients they have, the more, you know, the more of a defense they can put up against pests and disease, you know, um, just like our bodies. So, yeah, but what I did different this year uh, that last, than I did last year, uh in march i put fertilizer down in my garden organic fertilizer and uh uh something for micro it's, it's it's like for fungus and stuff like that it's natural in the soil i put right. all that down and i just put it down and then it snowed and so this year I, I, you know, I refresh my soil because like you said, like, like Keto was saying, a lot of times we take from the soil, but we don't put back in the soil. Right. And I get, comp I get compost from y'all every year. So I put fresh compost. So we take from, it just, it's like down South. I had to learn this from my grandmother. She said, when they plant cotton, they mm -hmm. move because cotton took so much nutrients from the ground. They kept moving the cotton to different places. Like that because it take it took so much uh, nutrients from the ground, so that that you know the plants take from the from our uh, from, from our beds, so we got to replenish our beds back too with fresh compost, perlite, vermicomite, you know all that type of stuff. But what about the manure? The I don't do manure. I don't. I don't do manure. Other people do. I don't do manure. Manure is oh. fine. Manure is great. I, I just don't do it. Because they have the scent, the one that doesn't have an odor to it. Mm. Uh, I just a, not, I have been, I have never done. I just use compost and uh, organic fertilizer, and perlite, and vermicomite. That's what I do in mine. So I have never I have never tried. Uh, I I'm the, they got one called black cow. They say it's pretty good. Yeah. So I, I never tried it in mine. I never used it. Yeah. That's all. It's kind of hard. Um, I know you see. <laughs> so I, I see a question from Catherine. We're, we're gonna we get, we're gonna wrap up here in a few minutes. We're gonna almost at time, and I want to be respectful of everybody's time. But we have a few quick questions at the end here. Um, Catherine's saying, I guess if you could clarify, but you were saying we can buy compost, or are you asking where can we buy compost, or, or what, can you clear? Can you maybe come off mute and? and clarify your question there yeah uh mr carter said that he gets the compost from uh from you guys so i just wondered oh, i never right. saw it listed as right compost yeah so compost is available as what we call an additional resource 
Um, and so though we have, uh, we have a few uh, resource centers that we partner with organizations that we partner with around the city that we drop compost off that you can pick up from. And though we call those additional resources and those, the, the kind of spirit of that, the, of those resources because there are limited resources that um, we, we used to, before pandemic times, we used to have a requirement to do some kind of volunteering or something to become quote unquote active right. in the program to access the compost. Right. Because of, you know, because of, it's not so easy to do these days. We just, we still want to hold on to that spirit. And we think it's a really po powerful and positive thing for the gardening community across the city as a whole. So all that said, you know, um, there are compost locations and I can help you, you know, figure that out, out where to locate those. Um, and that's just a member, you know, and if, if you could just consider, you know, either, either whether that be helping your neighbors garden down the street or helping out and coming and volunteering at the farm or something like that. Um, oh, absolutely. Uh, and T just, uh, T just shared a, a link to it in the chat. Thank yeah, you. on our new website, we have a, uh, a page just for GRP members. If you go to the Garden Resource Program, it says, um, it says uh, 2022 members, and there's a password that you got in your mail box, and we're recording, so I won't say the password, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, Wait, you your password, can, can, can all I those can I say this? You used to volunteer. You're right, Keto. But another thing, you got to remember, you got to have a strong back because you got to dig it, uh, dig it, uh, shovel it in and shovel it out. You know? right. right. You got to pick it up yourself. Yes. <laughs> you got to do it yourself. So it's a little work. Right. It ain't like somebody right. going to do it for you. Right. Yeah. Um, okay. So Elnora is asking here, can you pre-treat the soil and raise beds with diatomaceous earth before planting? I don't do you want to speak to um, I have never tried that. Um, and so because uh, because when you when you when you put it out like that, it cuts it cuts the insects up. So you bury it. You know it cuts the insects that you know fall. It cuts them up. You know that. Right. So, correct. Yeah, yeah. It's like the diatomaceous earth is like crunched up seashells. I think. Yeah, it cuts them up. So yeah. They so when they eat it, they yeah they crushed like 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 Mr. Carter says. So so put it in the soil before like like if it rains, you got to reapply. I think it's I don't know I don't know that that would work. Okay, but so. I, you know, yeah, I, I would tend to agree that like you want to be more <clears throat> in direct contact with the insect to be yeah you want them to eat it <laughs> basically or, or walk across it. I walk, I walk across it, but when they walk across it, it's custom, I think. Right. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay, last question. Althea, you got your hand raised. Um. Yes. So um, thank you guys for everything. I have been a member for three years. And the first, this is my third year. The first year, my husband and I used the compost and my garden did really well. Last year, we expanded the garden. It didn't do it as well at all. And we thought it, the squash bugs and all this, but we went and bought compost from some of the um, the companies like off of Six Mile and Livonia. <laughs> and so this year, one of the things my husband wanted me to do was to see if someone can share with me, what company do you get your compost from? Because um, we're only allowed to get so much uh, compost from you guys um, through right. the GRP program, but I have a quite a large garden this year. So he wanted to know if we could actually just purchase or how much he wanted to see how much it would cost to purchase the compost that is donated to you guys. Um. Yeah, we, we, we don't get it. We do purchase it and um, I can share that uh, resource, but um, I don't know if you want that large, large load like that. Um, there are, no, there's, no, um, I'm sorry yeah. to cut you off. I'm so sorry, but he has a, um, a trailer and he doesn't want to like buy as much as you guys do, but he was wondering, is it a company that he can go to and just purchase what I need for the trailer to bring yes. back? 
Right. There yeah, is. Um, <clears throat> there's one local uh, farmer that um, is selling by the yard. His name, uh, that's Brother Nature. And um, Brother I can, Nature. yeah, you can look him up on Facebook and I can drop his number. He has hours you can pick up and sell. And, you know, you can either, even purchase it by the bucket if you okay. needed to. You can purchase it by the yard. And he does delivery as well. Okay. Um, and he's local. Um, so there's one or two uh, companies like that. Uh, Brother Nature has been in the program for a long time. Um, here's his number. If you want to connect with him or connect with him on Facebook. Um, if you guys are not a part of, the, if you're on Facebook and that's your thing, there is a Detroit Urban Farmers group. And there's a lot of information that goes back and forth in those groups around local resources and things like that. Okay. Uh, you may want to find that group. There's okay. a few, <clears throat> a few. Um, but here's Greg's number. Okay. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm familiar with Greg. He's a very nice man. Yes. Okay. Yep. Great. Greg. Good and guy. then I have one other thing. I am in desperate need. I know you guys are so busy right now, but I really um, needed someone to come out. And I forgot the gentleman that I had talked to. He said he was going to come out this week, but I haven't heard from him. I need someone to come out and kind of help me with um, the layout I have, uh, the design, because we were trying to add the hoops to the beds this year. I have all raised beds and I have um, container gardening. So we wanted to add the hoops and we wanted to add a drip water system in so that hopefully that could keep down with the squash, having so much fungi on the, um, on the, um, on the yeah. leaves and stuff. And the problem is, I think is, um, I don't think I'm utilizing my space as accurately as I could to grow as much as I would like to grow. And with all that we're trying to incorporate and because I didn't do well last year, I really wanted to try to make this a better planting season. So I was trying to get a site visit to before I actually plant. I picked up my cold crops last, uh, last week. So I got to get them in this week because I've been doing my heartening off process. So I really was hoping somebody could do a virtual or an um, on-site visit to help me. Yeah, we do that. And I just dropped in our email. Um, you just send a request to that email for a site visit and, um, and we can get you someone out there as soon as possible. I, I, would, I would say that this is, you know, these are this coming this week in particular, and, you know, this is a really busy time. So it's, you know, please be patient with us. We're trying to get out to help out people as much as possible, but it's, it's all, there's a lot going on for us at this time of year. I will. I appreciate everything you guys are doing. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, any other thoughts, questions before we wrap things up for the night? Okay. So great to have you guys. Um, thanks thanks for, for your contributions, everybody, including especially Mr. Carter. I, you know, it was great to see your plants and stuff. That was real fun. Um, so uh, again, we'll be recording this and I'll, and I'll share the video on the YouTube channel and the slides. And uh, good night. Have a great evening, everybody. Good night. Good, good night. night. God Thank bless. Good night. Good night. Thank, Thank you. you. Good night, everyone. Good night. All right. Good night. Good to see you, John. Good to see you, John. John. Good night. I was going to say, if you're new to the GRP, you know, you're missing something <laughs> in person for sure, right? I don't know. I wouldn't know. I just I took my daughter to emergency and um, I've been kind of tied up. That's why I'm so late. But take oh. care and I'll talk to you later. Okay. Yeah, right. we miss you. Bye. Thank you.